In this video, I'm going to be looking at aerobic respiration. So, first off, we can start with energy. Energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. Energy can only be converted to different physical forms, like sound, light, heat, kinetic, all sorts. It's measured in joules or kilojoules. So, why do we need ATP in energy? Energy is used for active transport of molecules, secretion of molecules, endoexocytosis in and out of cells, replication of DNA, and the movement in the cilia, or be it the muscles themselves. So, just some definitions here. Anabolic reactions are reactions in which smaller molecules all come together to form a large molecule. Catabolic reactions are reactions in which larger molecules are broken down, or hydrolyzed into many smaller molecules. We're going to quickly talk about the hydrolysis of ATP and how that releases energy to the body. So, when you have one molecule of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and you hydrolyze it by adding water, you get one molecule of ADP, adenosine triphosphate. Now this leaves you with a phosphate group on its own, PI representing the phosphate group, and this releases 30.6 kilojoules per mole of energy. Once again, when hydrolyzing ADP this time, you get AMP. That goes from adenosine diphosphate to adenosine monophosphate. Once again, 30.6 kilojoules per mole of energy is released. Finally, when hydrolyzing adenosine monophosphate, you just get left with adenosine, a phosphate group, and 14.2 kilojoules of energy. So, I'm going to quickly draw a diagram showing the differences between ADP, ATP, AMP, adenosine, and everything that makes up this wonderful molecule. So, at the top we have the organic base, adenine. We also have a ribosugar. So, if you just had adenine and ribose together without any phosphates, that would be called adenosine. With one phosgate, it would be adenosine monophosphate. With two phosphates, adenosine diphosphate. With three phosphates, adenosine triphosphate. So, I'm going to quickly talk you through the pathways of respiration. In this video, we'll be covering aerobic respiration. Respiration starts with glycolysis, and then you can differentiate whether you're going to go anaerobic or aerobic. The aerobic pathway starts with the link reaction, the Krebs cycle, chemiosmosis and oxidative phosphorylation, but we'll come to these in detail very soon. The anaerobic pathway is the lactate fermentation and ethanol fermentation, but I'll come to these in a later video. I'm going to quickly talk about oxidation, reduction and coenzymes. First off, NAD. This stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. As you know, electrons carry a negative charge, so when this loses electrons, it becomes NAD+. This means NAD has been oxidised. However, you also get reduced NAD, known as NADH. This is where the NAD molecule accepts two hydrogen atoms. These hydrogen atoms have most likely come from a molecule that have been dehydrogenated. This is known as reduction because the hydrogen atoms that are accepted by the NAD, technically speaking, have electrons with them. So really, the electrons have joined the NAD as well therefore reducing it. So, the first step of respiration, glycolysis. An ATP molecule is hydrolyzed. The phosphate group that has now come off this ATP molecule joins glucose to form glucose 6-phosphate. Here, isomerase enzymes change the structure of the glucose 6-phosphate to form fructose 6-phosphate. Once again, an ATP molecule is hydrolyzed, releasing another phosphate group. This then joins the fructose 6-phosphate on carbon atom 1, leaving you with fructose or hexose 1,6-bisphosphate. The hexose 1,6-bisphosphate molecule is split into two triose phosphate molecules. Here, the triose molecules are dehydrogenated. Each one is dehydrogenated, so the hydrogen atoms that have been taken off join the NAD molecule to form 2-NADH. Two ATP molecules are also produced at this stage. This leaves you with two intermediate compounds that you do not need to know the name of for the exam. Now, enzymes once again change the shape of these intermediate compounds until you're left with two molecules of pyruvate. Here, two more ATP molecules are also produced. So, let's look at the products. Two molecules of ADP are used up, as you can see in the diagram, during the hydrolysis of ATP. We gain two more molecules of ATP during the transfer of the triose phosphates into the intermediate compounds. We gain another two ATP molecules when changing that to pyruvate. We've also gained two NADH. So, overall from glycolysis, from one molecule of glucose, we've gained two molecules of ATP, 
two molecules of reduced NAD and two molecules of pyruvate. I'm going to draw a rough structure of a mitochondrion to show where it all goes. Here we have the outer membrane and then we have the inner membrane. In the middle we have the matrix. The two reduced NAD molecules and the two pyruvate molecules travel to the matrix. Here the link reaction and Krebs cycle takes place. So, before the next few stages, it'd be best if you understood the structure of a mitochondrion. The mitochondrion consists of two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. As you can see, the inner membrane is highly folded to form cristae. This increases the surface area. Between the two different membranes, you have something called the intermembrane space. Also, embedded in the inner membrane, you have loads of protein molecules called ATP synthase. So how are the different parts of the mitochondria specialised for their function? First up, let's look at the matrix. The matrix contains many NAD molecules to transport the hydrogens around. It also contains a compound called oxaloacetate. This is very important at the Krebs cycle. And the enzymes required for these reactions are all here. Next up, the inner membrane. The inner membrane is folded into cristae. This increases the surface area. The inner membrane is impermeable to most small ions. In the inner membrane, there are proteins, electron carriers embedded. I'm going to be describing these electron carriers as complexes. I'm going to quickly talk about ATP synthase. This is another protein molecule embedded in the inner membrane that is essentially responsible for generating ATP. As H plus ions in the intermembrane space pass through the ATP synthase molecule, it essentially spins it, spins the molecule around. And what this does, this combines ADP and a phosphate group to make ATP. I'll be coming to the full story about this very shortly. I'm now going to talk about the link reaction which occurs in the matrix of a mitochondrion. So, if you remember, a pyruvate molecule came from glycolysis. Two hydrogens are removed from the pyruvate molecule and they join with NAD to form reduced NAD. Also, a CO2 group is removed. The process of removing CO2, a carboxyl group, is known as decarboxylation. The process of removing hydrogen is known as dehydrogenation. The enzymes for these are pyruvate dehydrogenase and pyruvate decarboxylase. The enzyme names are quite self-explanatory. They describe the function. It always has A's on the end. For example, it's been dehydrogenated, so it's dehydrogenase. Next, you're left with acetyl coenzyme A. The coenzyme A leaves, so you're essentially left with acetate, which is essentially an ethanoate ion. So, now, the Krebs cycle. So, straight away from the link reaction, we've just had our acetate, remember? Now, this joins of a compound, which I'll describe in a minute, to form citrate. Acetate is a 2-carbon compound, citrate is a 6-carbon compound. The citrate is dehydrogenated and decarboxylated. This leaves you with a 5-carbon compound. Here, the exact same thing happens again. The 5-carbon compound is decarboxylated and dehydrogenated. Due to substrate-level phosphorylation, ATP is created during this stage at the 4-carbon compound, but you also have the same 4-carbon compound next. Now, this 4-carbon compound is also dehydrogenated. However, it's different than a NAD molecule. This time, it's a FAD molecule. This FAD molecule doesn't float around like NAD. This FAD molecule was directly attached to complex 2 as I described earlier. However, the next 4 common compound is dehydrogenated again, but this time it's back to normal. It goes to reduce NAD. Now, on the compound this creates is known as oxaloacetate, and this reacts with acetate to form citrate. This now means the cycle can start again. So, I'm going to go for a few ways of trying to get you to remember how this happens. Your citrate molecule is decarboxylated and dehydrogenated to form a 5 carbon compound. Your 5 carbon compound is decarboxylated and dehydrogenated to form a 4 carbon compound. So, from the 4 carbon compounds onwards, there's only one step each stage. First, you take ATP at the equation, then dehydrogenation occurs, you get reduced FAD, more dehydrogenation occurs, reduced NAD, and then you're left with oxaloacetate. If you think about it, the first two steps are basically the same. So, if you remember this one step, then you literally just need to remember taking ATP at the cycle, 2H at the cycle and 2H at the cycle and obviously remember that gives you reduced NAD, reduced FAD and the final product, oxaloacetate. The one molecule of acetate you started with came from one molecule of pyruvate. Obviously two molecules of pyruvate 
made up one molecule of glucose, so therefore one cycle is essentially half a molecule of glucose. Therefore, each molecule of glucose creates two cycles. So, in one cycle, in the link reaction, you get one CO2 produced and one reduced NAD. In the Krebs cycle, you're left with two CO2, three reduced NAD, one reduced FAD, and one molecule of ATP. But remember, this is for half a molecule of glucose, so we times it all by two. So overall, for one molecule of glucose, we're left with six CO2, eight reduced NAD, two reduced FAD, and two molecules of ATP. So, in the two stages, this is what we've had so far. Remember, the two pyruvate molecules are used up in the Krebs cycle and the link reaction. So therefore, overall, we've got 10 reduced NAD, we've got 2 reduced FAD, and we've got 4 adenosine triphosphate molecules. Finally, I'm going to talk about the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. I'm drawing a phospholipid bilayer, and I'm drawing my four complexes, my electron carriers, and my ATP synthase molecule. So, the top part of my whiteboard is the matrix. The bottom part is the intermembrane space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. One of the reduced NAD molecules then releases the hydrogens to form NAD again. The hydrogens then split into two protons and two electrons. The two hydrogens are accepted by complex one. So, the electrons now sit in complex one and what they do is they pump the protons, they use their energy to pump the protons from the matrix through the electron carrier into the intermembrane space. FAD, FAD, as I stated earlier, is a protein molecule that is attached to this electron carrier. However, FAD also accepts two hydrogens. The two hydrogens are passed on to complex two. Once again, they split into two H plus and two E minus. Now, complex two accepts the two electrons from complex one whilst accepting the two electrons from the FAD. So now it has four electrons in complex two. However, this time, the H plus ions remain in the matrix. Complex three then accepts all four electrons from complex two. It uses the energy to pump H plus ions that are in the matrix into the intermembrane space. The four electrons are then passed onto complex four. There is now a proton gradient between the intermembrane space and the matrix. The four electrons are passed on to complex four. Once again, this energy is used to pump H plus into the intermembrane space. Now, the four electrons and some hydrogens already left in the matrix form together with O2. Now, since there's a proton gradient, H plus ions, protons, can go through the ATP synthase molecule. As I stated earlier, this essentially spins the molecule, creating ATP. At the same time as creating the ATP, this hydrogen then joins the electrons and the hydrogens and the oxygen I've already spoke about to form H2O. So let's have a look. 4H plus plus 4E minus plus O2 gives you two molecules of water. So we've had two molecules of ATP gained during glycolysis. And we've had two molecules of ATP made during the Krebs cycle. So, so far we've got four. If you remember my little calculation earlier, we established that we had 10 molecules of reduced NAD. These should theoretically produce 26 molecules of ATP, plus these four molecules should give a yield of 30 ATP molecules. However, this is very rare. The reason for this being, the membrane isn't actually perfect. Protons can escape across. Also, ATP itself is used to bring the pyruvate molecules into the mitochondria from the cytoplasm of the cell in the first place. This has been aerobic respiration in a nutshell, calculated to be about 7.42% of your course. Get revising.